Hi Patrick, how are you this morning? Uh, not too bad. I've got a bit of a stinking cold, but other than that, I'm okay. So. Okay, well, in that case, I'm delighted to welcome you to TFT12, and more delighted that I'm doing it via a hangout. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. I know virus spread easily, but uh, not this way, I believe, so. No, no. Okay, well, thank you. Um, you are the um, last speaker in the um, EMEA region for TFT12, so we have made it through two regions, and we have one more to go for the next eight hours, so it's a bit of a momentous session, this one, so thank you very much for joining us, and thank you very much for being part of the journey. I'm delighted. Um, I, I, I can't believe that actually six months ago, I think it was at the STI conference, Steve, um, uh, Chris Dancy was talking to me about this. Um, uh, and within no length at all, uh, you guys actually had it going. So um, kudos. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's been um, a long time in Chris's mind, but it's kind of six months in the making. And actually when we... Um, we recorded last night and we announced last night that the next TFT will be TFT 13 and it starts on the 18th of June and we start that virtually and then we take it into our live conference and then we go out virtually when the SDR conference is finished. Very cool. So very we're cool. pushing the boundaries yet again. Uh, I'd like <laughs> SDI to do that. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're really looking forward to it. Um, I obviously know you really well. I've had the pleasure of chatting to you on a number of occasions, which is marvellous. Um, there might be the odd person in the world that hasn't had the opportunity to get to know you um, face to face or through the social channels. So I wonder before we kick off with your presentation, if you might um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what you do at Hornbill. Well, I, I suppose I qualified with computing, so um, and I was a technical bod for a while. I was kind of learned to develop, but uh, I'm better now. Um, so <laughs> no, I, I actually went through various different disciplines, largely in kind of consulting roles, uh, uh, finally into a technical director position, um, and eventually made my way into Hornbill uh, 15 years ago now, which is scary stuff. But yeah, 15 years ago, I joined Hornbill. So I've gone through kind of various roles at Hornbill, and now I'm, I'm chief evangelist. Um, and what that actually means, um, people think preacher and stuff like that, so I like to think I don't <laughs> preach. No, but uh, the best one I heard actually was uh, bringer of good news. So, um, so yeah, so what I do is I kind of spend time in the industry with some a lot of people that are a lot cleverer than me, um, and with our customers as well. And I a lot cleverer kind of, than you, obviously. A lot, no, a lot cleverer <laughs> than me. Um, and I learn what they do well, and kind of my role, I suppose, is to make sure that our products stay on track, and also that uh, customers get to know what other customers are doing well. Okay. So Brilliant. that's largely what I do. Excellent. Well, I'm going to hand over to you um, in about 30 seconds, Pat, to deliver your presentation and you can share your screen with us. Okay. Um, we will be taking questions over Twitter, so um, if you have a question to ask Pat, just um, tweet us using hashtag um, TFT12, and if you could also use the hashtag QFS, questions for speakers, that just helps us pull out the questions from the stream. And while I'm at it, I'd just like to say um, thanks very much to um, BMC Software who have sponsored TFT12 and thank you for to them for enabling us to make it happen. So um, I will be with you Pat but I will switch my mic and my camera off but I'll be listening so um, I'm now going to hand over to you to share your screen and I look forward to catching up with you with the Q&A with um, Mr. Dancy I believe is joining us for your Q&A so no pressure <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to live up to Chris do I? <laughs> I don't think that's possible for anybody no no absolutely not no 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 way okay good stuff all right well I shall go through these screen share stuff um, and I just share my desktop do I? Please, yep, yeah, and we'll just make sure that's working properly for you this end. Share a selected window, and with a bit of luck, um, we should now be looking at this. We are looking at that. Oh, we've got. I've gone again. Ah, there you on. go. Okay. <laughs> So is that okay? You can see me? I can see you, yes. Good stuff. All right. Okay. Um, well, I've already described who I am, um, and uh, I suppose I want to tell you what I'm talking about. So the title of my session is called Create, Innovate, Get Out of the Cave. Um, I think at events like this, you've got um, a lot of people speaking about futures. And uh, I've seen just Ian's, Ian Agent's pre presentation just now, and he's talking very much about the present. What I'm hoping to do is to kind of use some of my 
exposure to the industry, exposure to customers, really to, to paint a picture of where things will go in the future, but to look at the reality of the now and kind of what baby steps may need to be taken to get us to where we need to be. So my agenda, uh, I'm not going to bore you with telling you what I'm going to do, but essentially we're just going to have a look at the past. Now we're going to look at corporate IT strategy and what we can learn from that, kind of where we are now, best practice, and then some simple things that you can do to actually just be a little bit more creative, a little bit more innovative, and then we're going to look at possibly where things might go in the end game for corporate IT strategy. So straight into it, children of the revolution. So what's this all about? Well, essentially, um, in industry and in business, uh, things come along from time to time that basically radically changes how a business can, can operate and be productive. Um, so you got there anything from railways to electricity to communications and of course computing itself. And essentially the rules work in terms of supply and demand. So the, the way the provider, um, the, the importance of things to the provider and to the consumer, they evolve as the technology itself evolves. So initially, uh, you'll have a situation where demand massively outweighs supply. So the provider really is just focused. There's probably only one or maybe a couple of providers. They're focused on getting that out there, building the infrastructure. And the customer at that point in time, they're focused on getting it. Um, they're not so concerned about cost. If cost happens, uh, if the benefit happens to kind of perceive to be great, well, then, you know, they'll go through hell and high water and pay through the nose to get it. Uh, so they're largely concerned with acquisition. But what happens is, as, as the infrastructure gets built, you get a few more players come into the market. And as we know with the first release of anything, um, sometimes it doesn't work so well. So you've got this effort by the provider to stabilize the infrastructure, to make it run a little bit better. And at that point in time, the customer's really concerned about service. You know, this stuff does break. Can I rely on you guys to fix it for me? And that's how vendors tend to compete at that point in time, or providers tend to compete. So we move on, and, and again, once it's stabilized, you get even more people coming into the industry and, uh, and providing that same service. And then really, it's all about optimization. And the customer at that point in time has become used to the stability. They become used to things uh, working as they're meant to. So really, their biggest concern is cost. So you get this kind of commoditization that happens over time. Now, the graph doesn't stop there, because I think what happens is, essentially, you still get commodity products like coffee, but you'll get the likes of Starbucks, who sell a commodity product, but provide a service experience around it. So that, that graph continues, if you like. But I just want to talk a little bit about kind of Nicholas Carr and his book, Does, Does IT Matter? Essentially, what Nicholas is saying in his book is that as these infrastructures are built and as they come out, they offer competitive advantage. So things like that, the railway lines, electricity, but over time, they become utilities. Over time, really, they, they cease to offer that competitive advantage. People just expect them to work. And the importance of the technology itself tends to die down. I suppose he has a couple of solid points. Uh, I'm not saying technology is not important. But I think there's a subsequent publication, I can't remember the name specifically, but it says IT doesn't matter, but uh, business processes do. So we look back at kind of corporate IT strategy, because I'm, I'm using a little bit of this just to illustrate the, the difference from the customer, the service provider, and also the, the, the board's point of view, the executive's point of view. So when I entered into IT, as well as late 80s, there really wasn't that much interaction. So customers didn't have to depend heavily on technology, not IT anyway, um, unless you include things like uh, phone and fax, but it's just communications. People used to write letters, they'd appear in person, and communication between businesses, really there are a few IT-based interactions. So at that point, the corporate IT strategy, really, you could, it was a long line, there was no real pressure. So you could plan and invest in IT in isolation of anyone, perhaps except your suppliers. Um, the aim really was to get the back office more productive, more efficient, uh, to get more throughput. But executives weren't really concerned with the cost of IT at that point. You, you had to have it. If you wanted to be competitive, if you wanted to have that advantage, you really had to have IT. Internal IT, of course, they designed and operated everything. 
So they supplied the hardware, the, all the software, and they gave that to the employees, and the employees really depended heavily on them. No, nobody knew how this stuff worked, so really we had to depend heavily on the IT function to provide and service everything that we did from a technology perspective. As we entered the next millennium into the 2000s, I think things began to change. And I think that's the point here. Around every decade, you'll see a massive shift in how technology progresses. Uh, and of course, that's bumped sometimes, and, and we'll get to that later. But what we saw in, in around the 2000s was that customers and B2B and B2C interaction were becoming more and more dependent on technology. Email started to make an appearance. But employees started to kind of pick this stuff up, uh, and they wanted more of it. They were more demanding. They were kind of wanted that competitive edge in the productivity that it offered. But at the same time, corporate IT strategy started to kind of shift, if you like. Um, all these kind of costs, if you like, that started being added to, uh, to, to spreadsheets. Uh, executives were being asked to approve big sums of money and most of the time, it was the stuff they couldn't reach out and touch. It was kind of software and licenses. Um, and I think the whole boardroom perception was probably underlined by Y2K, things like the dot-com bubble bust. So they started the question, well, hold on a minute. Are we getting value for this stuff? How efficient is it making us? You know, how much is it costing us? And they started to demand some evidence. So the CIO, naturally, in response to that kind of boardroom demand, was, was focused on managing costs. So internal IT now was in a situation where demand was building. And really, they didn't have all the resources and the time to service that demand. They start to define and price services. They start to outsource some services. But the focus then for internal IT and the IT strategy really is efficient delivery of IT services. That's really where we get to kind of the decade of best practice. And just looking at that now, it says 2000 to 2010. I suppose I should say 2009. <clears throat> um, but what we see is that the ITIL publications, they've been around for several years before, but now they really begin to get a foothold. Uh, I remember in the early 2000s here in the UK, everything was ITIL. Um, and, and it spread around the world like wildfire. And, and it's no small wonder, really, why make the same mistakes when other people have actually learned from their mistakes and provided good advice and guidance. And this is great, but I think it's often quite misunderstood how this is adopted. Yeah, best practice makes sense. Um, it's going to drive you forward in many ways, but it doesn't mean IT service management. So it's just a set of books. Uh, it gives you some guidance. It tells you largely kind of how to, uh, uh, what to do something, but not how to do it. So IT service management, on the other hand, is about implementation of quality IT services and, and delivery of quality IT services that meet business needs. So, as a vendor, we often get a little bit frustrated about some of the things that happen and the things that we're asked to do. Um, this is the type of thing we see when people say to us, we want uh, a request for a proposal, or they want you to respond to it, or a request for information. And really, there's very little information within that document about the, the real business challenges that these organizations are, um, are, are trying to overcome. And what we get is we get this kind of tick list, this, this bullet list of, of all the kind of vital processes. It must do service portfolio, release management, request fulfillment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and really, at this point in time, most of the tools actually do all of this. Um, so it's very, very difficult for a vendor to deliver a solution that overcomes your challenges if all you're asking for is ITIL compatibility, because we don't know if that's going to be right for you. Of course, then when we implement, after saying we need 15, 16 processes, or whatever the case may be, when we implement, we find things are different. So in 2010, Hornbill did a, did a survey, about 900 different organizations um, across the globe, about 50% UK, 40% US, 10% rest of the world. And what we asked people was, look, what have you implemented? And I think actually if we re-ran the survey now, it wouldn't be that different. So what we get is we get this trend. So the items in, in dark blue, are that's what we've implemented. The items in light blue, are that's what we're planning to implement. So what we see here, the trend is incident management top, then change, then problem management. And then we start to drop below 50% for service level management. 
and tail off with some of the other processes right down to the more strategic processes on the right hand side service portfolio, demand management, financial management. The key thing there is that these are the processes that actually take you to, to alignment and to value. Um, and that's the issue for many. They, they don't really get beyond the more operational processes, perhaps a bit of service transition. So that, that's what we find anyway. So maturity. Maturity is talked about a lot. And actually, I think there's a fundamental flaw. I mean, maturity is great in terms of giving you a gauge of where you are and where you need to get to. But if you look at most maturity models, and I've just borrowed this one, it's a, you, you can look at CMMI, you can look at Gartner, you can look at any of the various different models. Well, they start off with chaotic and they build right through the value. Um, I've seen some different representations of you know, how many organizations globally are at what level. Typically, it says that about 3% around chaotic level zero and less than 5% up at value. So the majority, somewhere around 10 to 12% at service and the majority there between the reactive and proactive, representing almost 80% of the world's global IT organizations. Those are just rough guides and some figures. And, and my issue with that is that it takes a lot, a lot of effort. If you've been doing IT service management, if you've been adopting some of the ITIL or COBIT or whatever framework light your candle, you really have to implement more processes, employ more people, produce more documentation, reinvest in tools, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a long, hard climb up to value. If I'm a business owner, which actually I am an executive, and, and my IT function is saying, actually, yeah, we'll be truly aligned with the business and delivering according to business outcomes when we get to level four. I'm sorry, I'm going to have a problem with that <laughs> because my business thinks I do the IT stuff well now. That's what they think I, I should know and should be doing. That's what they pay us to do. All they're looking for is that value. They're looking for us to, to provide solutions that enable them to do the things that they need to do. So I'm going to move on to what we call here the, the, the outside in, inside out continuum. This is a, a graphic I borrowed from Ian Clayton at Service Management 101. So essentially, on the right-hand side, um, we have the traditional approach to ITSM frameworks, and it takes that inside view. So what we do is we're focusing on things like assets and events and functions, et cetera. And then we build that up over time. We become more effective at that. And then we go into things like uh, incidents and maturity, et cetera, et cetera. And we look at alignment as we go further. As I mentioned, that's a long, slow, hard climb. So really what we're doing is we're targeting just these parts. And it's a battle. It really is quite hard to add all these processes, to add all the resources, to add all these functions to eventually get the value. So on the right hand side, we have the stuff that our customers, the business talks about. They talk about things like relationships and customer experiences and satisfaction and loyalty. They talk about touch points and successful outcomes and et cetera, et cetera. Put whatever lexicon you like in there. The outside in, inside out continuum suggests really that what we should do is we should push pause, push the pause button on our traditional kind of relentless pursuit of, of process implementation. Just don't stop doing it. It's good stuff. We're not going to throw anything away, but just push pause for a moment and then walk out that right hand side, walk out the back door of IT, walk around the building and come back in the front door with the customer hold their hand and get them to walk you through some of the stuff that they value, some of the stuff that they're trying to achieve. Uh, and as you learn that, go back into your IT function and start engineering or re-engineering your processes so they're focused on those things. So that's really what we're talking about with outside in versus inside out. And I think to some extent, as, as great as some of the guidance is, we often take a different view as a service provider than we do as a customer. <clears throat> So, why is this stuff important? Well, things are changing at a rate of knots. And I don't know about you, but, you know, just in the last few years, things have moved on at a rate of knots because of mobility, social, all of that good stuff, and cloud. And actually, now we've got stiff competition. So, this is what happens on the internet in 60 seconds, which I, I think now equates to about five years between 2000 and 2005. Um, 
organizations, they're planning to allow people to bring their devices to work. Now, I, I know here at home, Bill, I already use my dev own devices at work. This is, is legitimate competition. Oh, sorry, we got some timing going on on these screens. Legitimate competition for us. We've got things like enterprise collaboration and, and the death of email, as people calling. I heard Ian on his last session say, turn off email for self service. And, and people spend too much time in their inboxes and, and it eats into too much management and productivity time. Uh, cloud computing is going to grow, perhaps not at the levels that were first suggested. Um, um, and predicted by some of the organizations, but there's no question. You've got things like Office 365 now, so I can subscribe to that. I can access it pretty much from anywhere. And the service providers who are providing these services, they know how this stuff works. They know what they've got to do. Of course, things go wrong, and we expect things to go wrong from time to time, but they really have some of this nailed. And managed service providers in particular they're putting together some really convincing information that suggests that business owners should look at outsourcing some of these lower value services that typically an internal IT support function would provide. So, consumers. Again, I, I, I still, it amazes me sometimes how quickly we forget what it's like to be a customer when we go into the business and put on our, our service provider hat. So, we buy stuff from Amazon. You know, we book flights, we bank online, we even access to, to things like government. So if I need to tax my car, if I need to submit my annual return, all of these things I can do online, access my apps. Apps in particular are changing things radically. So here, for example, sake, when I go to the airport, I go to the airport, I, I can book my flight online, I can check in at a kiosk, I can actually check on TripIt to see if it's all on time, I can present my boarding pass on my mobile phone, and when I get off of the other sign, I can actually book a taxi. All of this stuff without talking to anyone. Technology has moved from automating the back office into the middle office to automating the front end of the front office where customers interact with that technology. So. What's the comparison, home versus office? Mm -hmm. So if I've got all this stuff at home, how come I don't have it in the office? It's changing the expectation of your average customer, your average consumer. They expect to have more access to these services, more ability to serve themselves, more ability to access stuff from their phones, to carry their work with them. We got things like the explosion of BYOD, and small wonder if we can't match what they become used to, then they're going to start using their own devices for that particular purpose. So the office, we really need to get our act together and start looking at the things that we need to do. So where are we now? So we've got um, the first generation based on kind of corporate IT strategy, based on technology, well and truly behind this. Second generation, efficient IT delivery. I think that's where most IT shops are. We're still focused on delivering efficient IT services internally to the business. Businesses have moved on. They've moved into what we call the third generation, productively exploiting technologies. Now I'll come on to tell you what that means in a moment. And then after that, I'll try to predict what we call the end game, the fourth generation. Where might it go from there? So what's this productively exploiting technologies? Well, we're talking about creating value by doing this. I've already said customers, Consumerization is setting new expectations for them. They expect to be able to get an app straight away on their phone. Most of the IT that they get now will come from their own budget. So if I'm a VP of sales and I decide I need a new CRM application, I don't need anything more than a browser and a credit card to actually get that CRM application and get it up and running. In fact, I could be running it without any knowledge of my IT function whatsoever. Customers are also looking at peer-to-peer -peer and community support. I know myself, if I got a problem with something, probably the last thing I do is call the service desk. First, I'll probably Google it, then I'll ask other people, I'll perhaps reach out to the community. But this is now the norm. And instead of kind of resisting this, perhaps we should consider embracing it and reducing some of that workload. I mean, Ian was talking about self-service. Ian was talking um, in a previous session about the fact that you will get more calls. In fact, we're talking to some of our customers and what they're saying is, look, we can do things in order of business priority now. We're not kind of waiting in line for the next great thing to, to hit us that we need to respond to. We actually respond to the things that matter most. So 
this type of thing is is becoming the norm and really we should be, be assisting it rather than resisting it. So what happens with corporate IT strategy? So I, in this decade where consumerization is setting the new normal, the spending of the enterprise on internal IT from a strategic perspective is less and less important. Now I'm not saying that um, we don't need to worry about what we're spending on IT. We'll always be asked to deliver efficient and effective IT services. From, from, from a strategic, from a business perspective, we're not creating new value. We're perhaps stopping value being destroyed by delivering more efficient uh, IT services, but new value comes from a focus on your company. The things that you do for your customers that generate kind of ag advocacy, loyalty, and, and further the, the effort to make your brand a, a well-known brand, known for its service, known for its value. These things are focused on people, and they're focused on the things that they do with technology. They're focused on their communities. So what we're suggesting here is that where we think about IT and business as separate agendas or alignment, and that's over. That's rapidly coming to an end now. Um, internal IT, I think we are a generation behind. Um, we're seeing, seeing some evidence of, of IT organizations responding to this, but we have to shift our focus from just the internal use of IT and efficient delivery, disconnected from the, from the business outcome, and refocus on what are the things our users, our customers do? What are the mission critical activities they perform to achieve their business outcomes? Now, once we understand that, then we can understand that part of technology and, and the IT organization has to play in delivering that. So it's a difficult, it's a tough call because innovation, which is, I suppose, what we're talking about, innovation is used too much, but just, just, just thinking about it differently, refocusing, reimagining the role IT has to play. But it has different qualities or priorities over operation. So it's focused on individuals, people, how they interact. It's focused on getting software out there fast. You're seeing things like DevOps, Agile, Scrum, and all this other stuff coming to play because people want speed now. Actually, the, the, the battle, previous battle in business could have been be between big companies and slow companies. These days, it's between fast companies and, and slow companies. Sorry, big companies, small companies, previously, Fast companies, slow companies. Your business needs agility. It needs speed. It's looking at customer collaboration. It's looking at change in agility. Whereas operations, we don't want that change. We we looking to stabilize the environment. We're looking to keep things running. We're looking to keep services as available as they can be. So we focus on kind of processes, tools, contracts, a, a plan, a strategy, that type of thing for operations. That's a tough call. I'll get on to a little bit more how I think that might pan out as we go forward. There's a bigger problem even for organizations these days. So what I said was I, I'd mentioned some small steps that you can take to move more in the right direction. But this is a big issue. How can you make these sweeping changes? How can you become more proactive when actually this is what we're being told is that you know our budgets are, are not what they were. Our resources are less, headcounts reduce, but we're expected to deliver the same, if not a better level of service than we did previously. That's quite a tough call, but it's not impossible. So I'm just going to talk about making IT happen. So I, the reason I use this is just some of our customers. I'm not even going to go into what they've done. I just wanted to make the point that all these organizations have got one thing in common. And that thing is that they're out with their customers in the business, understanding what their challenges are, understanding how they can play a part in moving those customers forward. They haven't invested bucket loads of money in IT and, and haven't invested major re-engineering processes and that type of thing. They just got out. They got talking to people. And this really is how we need to progress and how we need to move forward. We can't just jump from reactive, proactive, right to value. We really need to, to earn the respect of the business to do that. And how we earn that respect is, is small and baby steps. Sometimes this stuff is right in front of us. Sometimes it's, it's really, really obvious, but we get this tunnel vision. We get this blinkered approach that, you know, we do what we do and we're used to doing that, so we don't do anything else. 
And really, we, we we can invent these these wonderful things that can be straight in front of us, but we can't see how we can get it shifted. So what I want to talk to you now is, is some of the baby steps, some of the things you can do to start earning the respect of your business. If they look at you as a break fix function, it's hard for them to see you as a kind of a trusted advisor of business strategy and advising them on how technology can help them realize their goals. So you've got to change that. And to change that, it is about taking some baby steps. Um, here's an article I saw in, in Computer World, which I thought, really, this is where the CIO needs to focus now. He needs to focus on getting IT people out there. So he talks about IT professionals being viewed as he, what he calls business engineers. And how he does that is he helps his IT team get out into the market. In this particular case, he said that um, in one case it meant getting on a motorcycle to deliver supplies down a street too narrow for a car. And what we see with SDI award winners, most of the people who are winning these kind of awards, what they're doing really is precisely that, getting into the business, understanding what the business does, the part technology plays, the difficulties it, it causes them, and how they can actually move things going forward. So. That's really some of the things I want to focus on. So the get out of the cave bit. We can stay in our caves. We can kind of keep our heads down. We can kind of keep things running and monitor stuff and kind of deal with service requests and incidents. And that's all good. And we can't stop doing that. But one of the things we really have to do is just get our stuff out there. So there's a few of our customers that do this. And I have to say, magnificent benefits in terms of how IT is perceived. The first thing is called a service safari, and the reason we're talking about a service safari is when you go on safari, you know, you don't sit down and you talk with the animals. You, you actually observe them for a little while. Um, I wouldn't personally recommend stepping out into the lions, but uh, if you get out there and spend some time with business units, first of all, just watching, listening, and learning, and understanding what they're doing and, and the role that technology plays in doing that, what we can then do is move on to asking them some questions. Oh, why does it work that way? Why does it not work this way? And, but once you've learned what you need to do, get those people, the IT or service desk staff, to back in to say, look, I spent a day with um, the sales team. I spent, spent a day with marketing or whoever it happens to be. And actually, this is what I found. So these are some of the challenges that they've got. Now, as a group, can we suggest just one thing that we could do to make a difference to them? I can guarantee you once you start doing that, things change, perspective changes, and they start to look at you as more of an enabler for what they want to do rather than the people they call when stuff goes wrong. A uh, complaint is a gift. So a lot of the time, I think when customers complain, we lose sight of the fact that actually they're complaining for a reason, and we take our service provider's view, and, and, and basically we say, oh, silly, they shouldn't have done this. But a complaint is a gift. A complaint, regardless of whether it's grounded or not, whether they've got a basis for that complaint, it's an opportunity for us to look at what we do from the customer's perspective. And that's what we're talking about, this outside-in approach. Once you start looking at things from the customer's perspective, things change. I think there's a great example that, that um, is usually used in sales training to basically make people focus on outcomes. And what it says is, is people don't want to buy a, a, an eighth-inch drill bit, they want an eighth-inch hole. Actually, that's wrong. If you take that from the customer's view, so if I want to buy a drill bit or I want to, it's not because I want to make a hole. It's probably because my wife is nagging me to put up a photograph or a picture somewhere, and I want peace and quiet. I just want to be left alone to play my guitar or whatever I want to do. So really, that's what we need to extend to. We need to extend to what is the real outcome. Why, is it, why are they doing this? Not the mechanism for doing it. So a complaint is a gift. We have an opportunity here to do something about it. So what we can do, first and foremost, this is just an idea coming from one of our customers, and I thought it was awesome. Um, Matthew White, you know who you are. Great idea. They were struggling to get feedback on some of their incidents, and, and I think it was about 8% of closed incidents they were getting feedback on. And he wanted some more kind of positive feedback and he just talked to some customers and they said, look, we haven't got the time to be doing this. So what he did is he re-engineered their feedback mechanism. And at the end of every day, customers got an email just basically if they'd logged an incident and it was closed, 
And that email basically asked them to click on a link, which took them to three buttons. Big smiley face in green or kind of red frowny face if you're unhappy. And all you had to do was click on one of those. There was a comment section underneath, which is just optional. But if someone left a negative piece of feedback and entered a comment to say, this is why I'm not too happy, any negative feedback with or without comment that came into them, that customer got a call from the service desk manager to say, how do we screw up? How do we not meet your expectations? What can we do to make things better? And what they did is they, they established this kind of program of continuing improvement. Now, I'm, I'm not talking continual service improvement. So I think when we throw the word service into it, we can mix things up a little bit. We're just talking about making things better. What are the problems our customers are experiencing and how can we make them go away? Uh, the moment we throw service into it, I think we begin to struggle a little bit because service is a term I think that we haven't really defined that well. That's a subject of a different, uh, a different talk. But if you can pick up those items, if you can make people responsible for doing just those little things to improve uh, the overall experience for the customer and, and publish that back out to them, then things start to swing in the right direction. Last thing here is get serious about your service experience. What do I mean by that? Service experience is becoming radically important. And as I said, customers view things differently to service providers. So you need to understand how the customer views things. You also need to understand where things might be different. I, I think in, in IT, we focused on this kind of best practice, a standard response approach. And that doesn't help us sometimes. Different customers have different needs. So here's just one idea. This is a typical kind of incident form. This is stuff you can do in your own service management tool. On the left-hand side, you got this kind of customer details areas. That's what you typically see. That's the information you see about the customer. But just here in the middle, in that red box, we've got this customer profile. Now, I don't know if you can see it on the screen. I've got it on a bigger screen here, which I can. But what it says, basically, when did I start with this? So this lady started in 2006. And... I can assume by the virtue of the fact that she started then, she probably knows the way around our business, our process, our applications. If she was here for three months, my response is going to have to be different than if she's here for six years. It also says her technical skills are low. That means I'm not going to say, look, Anna, run a command prompt and type IP config. You know what? I'm better off taking over a machine. And again, I can adjust the way I deal with that customer in accordance with her needs. The little yellow light at the bottom, that's our, our satisfaction indicator. And it's currently yellow, which means actually she's kind of nonplussed. We haven't super impressed her. We haven't really disappointed her. If that were red, if Anna was unhappy and had a bad experience, that told me immediately I may need to treat her with kid gloves on this occasion. One final thing is, is the services. So these are her priority services. If she's calling up about one of these, I probably need to jump a little bit higher than I normally would. Now, I need to know what's made up of that, that service is made up of, and of course, you can dig into your tools to, to find that out, but that's not the important piece. The important piece is here, here is how I deal with that customer, how I make them feel. Do I greet them well? So if you look at the uh, outside-in approach, Ian talks about the magic number 42, as the four E's. Four E's of the customer is basically the encounter. Did we greet them well? You know, did they feel welcome? Did they feel like uh, you know, we, we didn't come up, hello, IT? Have you tried turning it off and back on again? Uh, <laughs> but the, the second thing then is, is the expectation. What were they expecting? Yeah, and then the experience and finally the emotion. And the emotion piece only comes in really when we start to let customers down. You know what it feels like when you call someone up and they don't do what you expected. You're thinking, hold on, I'm a customer here. Uh, this is not about just going and hugging customers and being all customer kind of the cult of customer. It's not about that. It's about meeting expectations and delivering the experience the customer expects. So what can you do? Um, here's a couple of ideas. Just basically, if you want to show innovation, we are meant to be the masters of technology, but we're falling behind. We're, we're falling behind the way the world is moving. So we're talking about things like knowledge management. Well, why are you not producing videos for your top five incidents? Getting them out there on channels. You don't have to share them publicly, but you can. Um, if you're struggling with things like, oh, my mailbox is full, why not produce a little video? And it shows people how to archive their email and then publish that to your self-service channels. 
Really, really simple. Not difficult to do. The other thing I think is this whole BYOD issue, bring your own device. We're talking about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, whether it's wise, how much it costs, it's going to be difficult to support, all of that stuff. That's all well and good, but just burying our head is not an option. One of the things you can do is to say to people, look, register your personal device, and we'll give you, you, you they won't do that unless you give them a reason. So perhaps, again, maybe use a video, again, produce some content for self service. These are, look, we don't support iPads, we don't support iPhones, perhaps, but here's some of the stuff we get asked to do by our, our users. And, and look, we produce something to help you guys actually help yourselves. And that's the fact, if we've got 53 people in our business that are using an iPhone 5, well then chuck this stuff out there to them. Let them interact with each other. Let them do the community support thing and enable them to do these things. Also, once we understand what they're using, we can understand what they're using it for. Are you using specific apps for business productivity, for business purposes, and what are they? At least when we know what customers are using and, and how they're using it, we can then have some intelligent discussions with them about the cost, the risks associated, and how we may or may not be able to support some of that capability. Um, other things that I've seen customers do very, very well, things like IT open days. Get people along, bring coffee, sandwiches, cakes, whatever you want, but get them along, get them to talk to you about the things that uh, they're interested in, about IT, about technology, and how that helps them do what they need to do. Um, start a podcast. Um, I participate in the podcast myself. You know what? It's great fun. Uh, you can make it really entertaining. It doesn't have to be boring. But get business units in to talk about the things that they do, their challenges, and, and how they'd like to see things move forward. That in itself can be engaging. People will listen to it. The other thing is monitoring social channels. There's a lot of hype around social. Um, I don't think it's going to revolutionize the industry in the way that some are predicting. But the fact is, it is revolutionizing markets. It's revolutionizing views. You know, TripAdvisor, look at the effect that that has had on hotels. And so these social discussions are important. This community promotion and advocacy is important. You may even want to consider support by social channels. That may not be appropriate. But if it is, I'll give you some personal experience. Some personal experience here on the next slide. So this was a, a tweet from one of the end users at our cus uh, a customer organization. Sorry, Murray, to single you out here, but um, this is what he tweeted. He tweeted, if you want to get a service test for your, for your business, don't get support works. Fail, bad day at the office. Now, as a service management provider, that's not the type of thing we'd like to be going out on Twitter. But the fact of the matter is, we, we could have kind of ignored that. We could have, but we don't. We look for these things. We monitor the channels to see what people are saying about us. And, and, and then we take action. So in this case, actually, all it was, was Murray was trying to do something by self-service, and, and he didn't know the rights. So we contacted the administrators for his system and said, look, you got a customer here. He's, he's suffering. He's trying to do this. If he should have the rights, give him the rights to do it. So actually, two days later, this is what we got. Very impressed. Yeah, we rang him to... to discuss the issue is having great customer service. That's how you can make an influence. That's how, and really, as technology people, we should be helping the business understand how you do this stuff. Talk to your marketing team. They probably already have a handle on this already. If they don't, then we really need to be a little bit more innovative in how we approach these things and how technology can be used. That's what the business is expecting us to do, provide advice on how technology can, can be used moving forward. Okay, next generation. Uh, TSO have just published USM Bot, the Universal Service Management Body of Knowledge, into their best practice, um, international best practice uh, library. It's up on the website and it now sits alongside PM Bot, ITIL, and all the other bits and pieces. The thing is, this is not a different framework as such. It's not, oh, no, now we've got to switch from ITIL to something else. We can't throw the baby out with the barbed water. ITIL's really good. ITIL gives us some great advice on how we can do things, and it would be absolute nonsense to, to suggest throwing that away. What this is, is it layers something on top of the existing approach that basically says, hold on a moment, we've now got our mechanisms, we're operating quite well, but 
this allows us to take the, the customer's perspective, the consumer scenario, the views of the, how the customer sees things and apply that. And as Ian's quote says, we're in a service society. Yeah, how we deliver service and how we support those services defines how the customers react to us, defines loyalty, advocacy. So these are there's great hope for this. And I think things like USM Bach layered on top of what we already know is going to drive this industry forward. By the way, Exxon have just started producing the exams for USM Bach. I'm not sure if they're absolutely ready to rock and roll yet, but um, I, I believe they're out this month or next month at the latest. So service experience design. This is, again, comes from USM Bach. So this is the difference, I think, in terms of understanding the customer's journey, understanding the customer's service interaction. It's a busy slide, but what you've got really is pre-transaction, transaction, and post-transaction, three separate phases. So pre-transaction could be, you know, did you find us easy? Where did you find out about us? Was the website easy to use? Did you book your ticket or whatever you wanted to book online? Was that good? And what we'll find is that different points throughout the customer pathway, they had different levels of service experience. You may not be able to see it that easily from there, but essentially there's a line above those red uh, lozenges, there's a line which says the line of visibility. Things happen in the pre-transaction, transaction, post-transaction post -transaction phase that really the customer cares about, and we have to get those right. Those are the things, that, as they're called, moments of truth. You get those right, you can screw up in other areas, and the customer won't care. In fact, some of the time they won't even see it. But I think as service providers, we often fail to take that customer viewpoint. And what this service experience design does is it takes the customer viewpoint, it starts there. It then takes a service provider's viewpoint, and then it takes kind of what we need to do so that we actually deliver the right service. Don't wait for the hand grenade to be thrown into to your support team. Start to think about the things we can do to meet customer expectations and deliver service as we go. Okay, so are we talking about the end game for corporate IT strategy? So are we predicting the death of a separate strategy? Well, to some extent, I think we are, but we're not predicting the death of IT. So if I was to write the epitaph for, um, for a strategy based on technology, uh, I'd like to use Spike Milliken's, um, Spike Milliken's epitaph um, Spike has got this in Gaelic on his, uh, on his tombstone. He said, I told you I was ill. But actually, I don't think that's going to be it. I think it would be more like Mark Twain's comments. Rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Um, Technology is everywhere. Technology is becoming more and more prevalent. It's front end of the front office is moving more into that domain, and there's more demand for technology than ever before. But what I do think is going to happen a lot of people are predicting this, is that essentially the internal IT support function as we know it today begins to skinny down. More and more of those services like Office 365, they disappear into the cloud. They're managed by other people. They're low value. And really, we start to get an internal IT function that begins to get smaller and smaller. Now, we don't lose people from that function. They move out into the business. They become kind of business engineers. They become the, the people who understand what the business needs to achieve, and they can translate that into how technology can deliver that. They will do things like manage service providers, um, stuff that we're particularly bad at at the moment. But this is a role I think is going to be really incredible as we move forward. That can be scary. Um, so what's the end game? So the end game, really, we're predicting that um, generation four IT becomes investment in change. So really, this this separate corporate IT strategy begins to disappear. And what we have is we have mainstream business management taking over. IT and business um, strategies, they cease to exist as separate subjects. IT is business, business is IT. And IT, information technology, is just business technology. But this, the strategy becomes about the value and the cost of investing in change. Yeah, how well do we achieve our goals based on the investments we're making? And there's two distinct areas. So there's operations, we still need to run stuff. That doesn't go away. There's things that we just can't hand over. No matter how many great service providers are out there, there's certain things that IT organizations do that really we can't hand over to someone else. The other component is investing in change. 
as I mentioned earlier, the split between innovation and operations, that's a tough call. That's a tough call. So there is a, a train of thought that says CIOs, actually the leadership was split into two different areas because you have a different mindset, you get different skills, different measures of success, whereas one has been tasked with stabilizing the infrastructure and the environment and, and taking out a risk-based approach. The other one's like, change everything, do it fast, do it as quickly as you can. And it's difficult to manage both of that with a single leader. So don't be scared of it. I think the point that this image is making is that change is, is probably the only thing that's constant. Um, things move on. Things move on at a rate of knots. I think over the last few years, we've seen that happen. But one thing that does happen is that people get scared of change. Um, but like this guy here on the left-hand side on, on, on the roller coaster, um, he's scared. But, you know, once you get out the other side of it, I think we are now entering a time where working in IT is going to be incredibly exciting. I think it, it has the opportunity to be the profession you always wanted to work in. But we don't start acting now. We can't sit in our caves and kind of do our own IT strategies and focus on kind of keeping things running, keeping things ticking over. We have to get out. We are part of the business. There's no alignment. We're part of the business. We've got to get out there, understand how our business people operate. So my last point really is um, I'll give you some resources after this, but I think the focus has to be right. I do a bit of photography. This is what we call a tilt shift lens. What a tilt shift lens does, it allows you to take kind of pictures of architecture, um, buildings, we'll say urban landscapes. Problem with that is if you've got a camera, and you kind of lean back to take in a big building. When the photograph comes out, it looks like the building's toppling over. Tilt shift lens, what it allows you to do is it allows you to, to keep the whole picture in perspective, but to change your point of focus. And that's what I'm saying here is that really, where is delivering great service internally is important. You have to keep that in perspective, and it's good to focus on what our customers say, what your customers say about you. But really, when we start to shift that focus and we start to make a difference is when we start to focus on what their customers say about them and how technology plays a part in delivering that great service. Some use of resources for you, US Embark, I mentioned it several times, the link is there. Uh, four Generations Corporate IT Strategy, it comes from a guy called um, Chris Potts and Chris, uh, you'll find him at DominicBarrow.com. Great document, have a read of that. And also, Charles spoke last night, uh, Charles Arujo, on the, the Quantum Age of IT. That was a great session here on TFT. Definitely recommend you tune into that and definitely recommend you have a look at his book. I've seen the, the pre-release of it, um, blown away by some of the stuff he's talking about, really, really eloquently described. Um, listen, get involved. So I've only shown examples for, for two podcasts here, but... Uh, Service Fear, running this podcast, I think we're getting about 40,000 listens a month. And now we've got several of them on stream. So we've got the US one, we've got rest of the world, which is the UK one. I don't know why. <laughs> we're the rest of the world. Um, and then you've got kind of top of the world and also the down under crew in, in, in Australia. If you do nothing else, share. Get involved in the discussion. We're a community. We only drive things forward as a community. Join back to ITSM. There's about 400 or odd professionals on there. Many of them, some of the, the top minds in this industry. Tune into that, ask questions, listen to what's going on. You'll definitely get value from it. And what I would say as well, you've got some great local groups, SDI, they're bringing this to you today. Join them, go to some of their events, sit round tables, talk to people. You can get some great value. And ITSMF, of course, you'll have local chapters in your own countries. Uh, you'll have local service uh, management focused uh, groups and initiatives um, and, and pitch in, get involved. Um, together we can drive forward this community and move in the right direction. So that's me really. So thank you very much for listening to me and Tessa. Uh, my details are there on the, on the screen. So my Twitter handle and my email address. Um, and I think we can publish the, um, my phone number if they want to. I've, I've got no problem with people contacting me. I hope I added, added some value to this, and I hope you enjoyed listening. Yes. Oh, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs>
know what? Uh -huh. It was all going so well till about 30 seconds ago when I invited Mr. Dancy to the stage. Be quiet. Right. Okay. Oh, Tessa, so, how do I get back to... Um... If you do, uh, if just click screen share again and it'll bring you ah, back. There we go. All we need is IT people here. I'm, yeah, I'm clearly an IT person. No, that was absolutely fantastic, Pat. A really, really great way to kind of end um, the Emir stint of TFT12. It was great. It was all around kind of customer service, which is really a theme from um, the Oceana region this morning, which was great. Um, love the idea of videos, obviously, because, you know, we're doing video now and here, here and now. And um, just one question. You talked about um, the IT service winners earlier in your presentation about how they kind of went out and met the business and kind of got engaged with the business. Was that, do you think, a deliberate strategic decision from those organizations or did it just happen organically? Um, I, I think actually most of the time, Tessa, this comes from leadership. Okay. Um, so I, I, I talk to different CIOs all the time and, and I'll go in and meet a CIO and say to them, look, what's going on? What are you up to? And some of them start talking to me about over oh, upgrading the infrastructure and we're doing this. And, and it's kind of more of a technology skew, if you like. Okay. I'm talking about some IT leaders. I go in and I talk to them, and really, we don't talk about technology. We talk about their business and the plans that they've got going forward, and the things that they're planning technology-wise to support the development of those plans going forward. Leadership makes a huge difference. It doesn't have to be a CIO. Yeah. I've seen service desk managers come in with the right attitude, basically saying, look, let's get in tune with what our people actually need here. Let's get out there and talk to them. And it's those people that kind of tend to get in touch with their community and understand what's important to them. Those are the ones that make this happen. Yeah, I think it was Charles, wasn't it, who said earlier something like um, you should live your life in their shoes when he was talking about their customers. And I think um, Mark played a bit of that video this morning as well. So that was fabulous. Um, got some great comments on Twitter. Um, Mark Smalley is addicted to TFT and he can't wait for um, TFT 13. Um, D. Billing has just booked rehab apparently for tomorrow because he doesn't think he's going to get over TFT 12. Um, and also, actually, um, we have our first um, TFT 13 presentation request up there already so somebody's already wow. submitted to speak at TFT 13 and that's Mauricio your good friend Chris Mauricio yeah it'll be good he's, he's a great uh, he gives great angles I mean and he's a doctor he gives good eye tell <laughs> he does indeed and he's a doctor <laughs> one of our few eye tell doctors yeah. I, I actually I actually have a team of professionals <laughs> <laughs> right I think that just leaves me to say, um, Chris and I are going to hang hang on for a minute, but I'm going to say well, goodbye pack to you. It, pack, pack and hang around while we you know, just we have to. It's going to go downhill with you two. I feel like a rose between two thorns. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's funny, Pat. Uh, you were with me uh, at, at, at SDI's Dream Conference in June when I said, I have this idea. I know. <laughs> that always scares me. I always get frightened when I hear that. I need to, I need to get out of the limelight and behind the camera. I, I need, and I think the quote was, Hitchcock. More Hitchcock, less psycho. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think you, you, you're delivering on both, though, in fairness, Chris. <laughs> and and you, we know how I am with the birds. So um, 16 hours down. Yep. We've got 16 hours down. 500 people have gone to the TFT 13 speaker submission site in 16 hours. Uh, we got eight hours coming forward. It's really been interesting, Pat and Tessa, watching the different regions and which regions react to which speakers and which regions, because uh, we also have impressions and we're using Radiant 6 and a bunch of tools to watch these things. Um, but I think, you know, uh, somebody asked for a, a, a vote. Some put up all the videos and let people s s vote on the best uh, speaker. Um, I did. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of a crazy idea. So, uh, and the yeah. other thing is, some people have just stayed up. I know they've been up. They've been up longer than I have. That shows real dedication. Somebody actually put something about them. There are no passengers on a spaceship TFT twelve. We're all crew, and that's pretty much true because without the speaker staying up, we could never have made this happen. It's been the support has been tremendous. But yeah. there's some. That's the point. There's some fantastic people in this industry. Chris, you're aware of that. Tessie, you're aware of that. People who you know, it's not about promoting their ideas and stuff like that, but a real desire to just take the whole industry forward. Hmm. They know that certain things are broken. They know that, yeah, and, and they just want to use examples and share the stuff that they they see that's working well. And and this is not about kind of 
transformation and all that type of stuff. It's about little baby steps to move us in the right direction. That's the point. So we have in, so the sun has come up here now. You can't tell because I have, I have the lighting still on. Uh, I still have the lighting on rea relax. Should I change the, the lighting in the room? <laughs> yes. Yeah, to wake right, up. So, uh, let, let's do wake up lighting. Um, I'm loving the new outfit today. Oh, thank you. I have one for the clothes. I have a tiara for the clothes, not really. Yeah, well, I, 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 have, I have a glove. So uh, we've got coming up, we've got uh, Peter uh, from uh, Service Management Art uh, up next. My uh, Antonio, Oscar. So we, I think we've got two presentations in Espanol. Fantastic. So that'll be exciting for people. Uh, Matthew Hooper, but knowing his technology, let's just skip that hour. Uh, Mark Kawasaki and, and Farah coming on from Atlanta. Rob England still up on the show. Richard White uh, caused a controversy with his ITSM. Who knows about this video? At his user voice conference, and then we close with Ian Clayton. Ian Clayton. Wow. We do, and apparently there's a rumor that Ian Clayton will be wearing speedos. So. Um... <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> I don't think you can broadcast that. <laughs> Mate, um... hopefully we sitting down. Be fine. Okay, so uh, Pat, thanks so much for uh, closing out of me. Uh, always good to see you, and uh, I guess we'll get going here in about less than one minute with Peter from Calgary. Yep. Okay, guys, okay. thanks a lot. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, what you're doing here is great, and it's just moving the industry where it needs to go. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Chris. I'll see you on the other side. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.